1962, I joined my first band, the Atlantic Blues. We really wanted to do some shadow stuff, but first of all, our guitar player wasn't actually that good. And secondly, the shadows didn't have a piano player, so we didn't do it. Bruce Welch, why didn't you have a piano player? Didn't need one, Rick. Right. Didn't need Thanks one. very much. <laughs> <laughs> you, you've got one now, though, haven't you? We have now. Well, we have, uh, you know, synthesizer players and all that stuff now, yeah. all clever stuff, as you know. But of course, in those days, you didn't, you know, it was just a rhythm guitar, lead guitar, bass guitar, drums. And, and three chords in any key. Oh, you did more than three chords. That was what was Eventually. really clever. Eventually, but three chords got us through the first two or three years. Any yeah. particular key? Was it always the same? A. It was always A, a. minor. Shadow's career is in A minor. <laughs> Apache. <laughs> but I mean, <laughs> Man of Mystery, all of them. Apache wasn't the first single, though, was it? No, it wasn't the first single. It was the first hit Yeah. in uh, July of 1960. We'd had three flops before then. Did uh, they sell afterwards? Well, I think, you know, EMI keep putting out... They didn't sell. They didn't become hits. Mm. Certainly, Apache was the first single hit. The band had, of course, because we were Cliff's... We were Cliff's band for 18 months before that. Uh, uh, let's go right back to the beginning. I mean, it, it's, it's very well known that, that you weren't the Shadows, first of all. No, we, <coughs> we started with Cliff in October of uh, 58. That was the very first tour. And it was the Cliff Richard and the Drifters, because his band was his local guys with the Drifters. Um, that, as I say, that was October 58 on the Kalin Twins from America. had a fantastic record called When. <clears throat> so they were top of the bill. It was a, a bit of a variety act bill, you know, had Eddie, mm. Eddie Calvert playing Oh, oh Mine Papa. Oh, wow. Well. Closing the first half. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think there was a, a trio on there, you know, the usual sort of variety bill. And uh, Cliff and the Drifters were on just before the Herbie and Hal Kalin, the Kalin twins. And of course, Cliff was sexy then, you know, he had the pink jacket. First <laughs> tour, we were, uh, Hank and I were 16. Cliff was 16. 16, yeah. But you, Cliff you, was 17. You were working with Hank before you teened well, up. Well, I with went Cliff, to school though. with Hank. Right. Yeah, from in Newcastle. We met at school <coughs> when we were 11. We uh, passed the 11 plus somehow, as it was in those days. So, how did you become a band? How did you pick up guitars? <coughs> we picked up a guitars basically um, in 1956. Skiffle came. Well, Trad yeah. Jazz was there first, Chris Barber and his band. and Yeah. And then Lonnie, as you know, Lonnie Donegan was his uh, banjo player. Yep. And Lonnie Donegan Skiffle Group came out of that. And Rock Island Line. And Skiffle was always, Lonnie always used to say, Any, this is sort of, anybody can play this music. You know, all you need is a, two or three acoustic guitars and a, and a tea chest yeah. bass and a washboard and all that sort of stuff. And I think <clears throat> people like Hank and myself, uh, John and Paul in Liverpool, everybody had a skiffle group. So I had one skiffle group at school. Called Which, the, what was it called? The Railroaders, right? And Hank had another skiffle group called the Crescent City Skiffle Group. Now, Hank was the, uh, the purist. So he had the, the duffel coat, the college scarf, and he played banjo. <coughs> oh, he played yeah. banjo. So he would be doing Lead Belly and, you know, Go Down, all, oh. uh, all that stuff. And my skiffle group was, I liked Elvis and uh, Blue Blue, you know, Fats Domino, all mm -hmm. that stuff that was happening. Because 56 was fantastic for yeah. rock and roll. Apart from Lonnie, Lonnie was the catalyst here, without a doubt. He, he made thousands of people like myself and Hank pick up a guitar. You know, that's really, we owe that to Lonnie, I think. So um, how did you join together? Well, <clears throat> we had the two skiffle groups at school, 14 years old. Fif nearly 15, and uh, as I say, I used to do Elvis stuff and Lonnie stuff, so I was like a commercial, the railroaders were commercial right. at school, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I wanted Hank to join, and, and uh, we just moved on a little bit, and for Hank's 16th birthday, his dad bought him a, a Hofner Congress guitar, 16 guineas, but a guitar, mm. you know, and I got Hank to join the railroaders because he was a great he was a great player even then he could, did you, he could play did single play? notes <laughs> which is unheard of he, unheard of he could actually play single notes at but, 16. but where did you play was it just like a rehearsal fun at school <coughs> rehearsal you... fun at school 
And then in Newcastle on Tyne, they used to have sort of, um, we used to call them up north, go as you pleases. And they're little talent competitions, maybe on a Friday night or a Saturday night. And there'd be half a dozen, you know, there'd be an opera singer on and a skiffle band and a, a vocalist, you know, who thought he was uh, Frank Elaine. Yeah. So, and, <clears throat> and if he won, you, you won two quid. So we used to win a few two quids, you know, as because oh, right. skiffle was happening and everything was happening. And so we'd do Lonnie and all, all this stuff, just copying the, the music of the day. And were uh, you a vocal band as well? Did you sing? Yeah, or? we sang, yeah. yeah. Um, well, I sang because I thought I was Elvis. <laughs> <coughs> or what? <coughs> I was trying to be a cross between Elvis, Fats Domino, and Little Richard. Uh, it, it's not easy trying to be a cross between you know, No, that's, at, that's at tricky. At the age of 15, that's trying to be all of those in one go. Any writing then? Doing any writing? No, not at, uh, not at 15. At 16, we came to London. Um, Why? Well, <clears throat> the railroad is, at, first of all, in 1956, we'd uh, Toby Steele, yeah. who unfortunately is often forgotten here. Yeah. Tommy came out of a place called the Two Eyes Coffee Bar, and there was lots of publicity. This, this guy was a merchant seaman, <clears throat> came back, went to this coffee bar in Soho, um, was discovered by, <clears throat> I think, Larry Parnes yeah. and John Kennedy. Mm -hmm. We're going to make you a star, son. And Tommy said, well, you, you've only got two weeks because I'm going back on the ship. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, all that sort of publicity was yeah. going <clears throat> in the Daily Mirror and all that stuff, mm. you know. And um, somehow the railroaders heard about a, a talent competition in London at Edmonton, the Granada Edmonton. And uh, you got rid of the Crescent thing that had gone. You, the Crescent you, City had gone because Hank had joined the railroad gotcha. now playing single notes. <laughs> Clever stuff. So we came to London and the band came to London, the Skiffle Group, for the weekend. The competition was on Sunday night at uh, Edmonton. I forget what we played, actually. We played Skiffle songs, probably, we were mm -hmm. a Skiffle Group. But we didn't win. <coughs> and. Uh, we came third. Do you remember who won? Who came Yeah, second? there was a Malaysian opera singer. <laughs> <laughs> there was a household band. name. He's a <laughs> household name in Malaya. <laughs> <laughs> then there was a trad band, you know, because trad was huge. Yeah. Then, you know, yeah. it really was huge. And we came third, the railroaders anyway. So Sunday night, we're in London, and the manager of the theatre said, uh, where are you going to stay tonight? We said, well, we don't know. We don't we don't know anybody when you've just come down, you know. He said, big Scots guy, was He said, well, you must have some... I said, no, we're just going to go, I don't know. He said, oh... And he rang someone. He rang... It turned out to be a landlady in uh, Finsbury Park, Holly Park. Now, as luck would have it, how lucky can you get? This lady was a Geordie. Oh. And, and he said, we got, I've got a couple of Geordies here who got nowhere to sleep, you know, nowhere to stay tonight. And... Well, oh, they can come and stay with us, you know, stay with us. So Hank and I went there. The other two guys said, we're going home. The, two, the other two guys in the band, because we'd lost oh. the competition, Hank and I said, we, we think we'll stay. Not knowing, you know, we'd left school. We were just 16, <coughs> left school. And we went and stayed at um, Mrs. Bowman's in uh, Finsley Park. And we stayed with her for about nine months. She, <laughs> le she let us have, she had an attic room with a little gas fire. Remember those gas fires? Yeah. You get the mottled legs when you sit in front yeah. of the gas fire. Excellent. I've, I married one of them, you know. They're <laughs> but, um, so this good old landlady let us stay there, and uh, this is April the 6th, I'm good at dates, April the 6th, 58. So we were 16. The next day we went to the Two Eyes, we found the Two Eyes coffee bar in Soho. And it was the coffee bar era. The whole of Soho was mm. Italian coffee bars. In Newcastle on time, we'd never seen a, uh, a watch oh, yeah. machine. You know the old machine, yeah, the coffee yeah. machine? Mm. Gaggia, whatever they call. Yeah. You know, frothy coffee, never, never, you know, couldn't afford it anyway. And the cheese rolls had little black bits on the top of the, <laughs> never seen in Newcastle, never yeah. seen them. You, know. you do now. You do now, yes. <laughs> anyway, so we're in Soho, 16. Go to the Two Eyes, and it, the Two Eyes was a place <coughs> where everyone got up and sort of jammed with everybody else. Can, we, can I get up and do a couple of numbers? Can we, can we sit in with you? You know, that sort of place. And um, everybody was going there, all the wannabes. I want to be famous, I want to be a rock and roll star, because Tommy had come out of there. 
So that's why we went to Soho. And from the first week of April till the end of September, we were at the Two Eyes probably every day. Did you get up and play? Get up and play, yeah. <clears throat> Hank and I were known as the Geordie Boys because you know, we were from Newcastle. We had to tone down our accents because nobody knew what we were talking about. You know, <laughs> all, Where are you? Like, oh, I'm <laughs> but Hank and I thought we were, you know, the Everleys, Elvis, Fats Domino. Any famous Ch people in there at the time? Go Not on. famous, no. 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 Terry Dean had come out of there. Terry came oh. out of there. He covered um, a white sport coat. A uh, white, before mm. your time, this is. I'm afraid Don't it's forget, not. you're just a young man. Oh, I wish. Yeah, 67, I'm an old man now. <laughs> I'm not far behind Terry you. Dean was there. Larry Page, the teenage rage, yeah. came out of there. Yeah. But um, it was just a, a little breeding ground of a tiny little coffee bar, probably, you know, 100 people in, at a you know, real push. Tiny stage at one end, about 18 inches high, uh, and about a yard wide, you know, so you just stood along. Um, and during, I mean, we met so many people. Uh, once they knew who we, who we were, and we didn't have any, you know, no money and stuff. <coughs> Paul Lincoln, who was the owner, who was a wrestler, he, he wrestled as Dr. Death. <laughs> Dr. Death. <laughs> and he's in Southampton, he's still alive. Good old Paul. Wow. And they used to, if we were lucky, they would pay us uh, 18 shillings a night which is 80p, I guess. Yeah. 80p. Yeah. <coughs> and you'd work from 7 till 11, singing and playing and jamming. And, and during those few months, uh, at the age of 16, we played, we got, up, we got to know and played with uh, Jed Harris, yeah. Tony Meehan, <coughs> Brian Bennett, uh, Licorice Locking, all guys who eventually became the, shadow. the Shadows, or were in the Shadows. And... Uh, we just met so many people. It was great fun, you know. Sixteen years old, you're yeah. in London. It was, it was a happening time. Every coffee bar, heaven and hell was next door. All coffee yeah. bars, the macabre, you know, with coffins and skulls on the seats and all that stuff. I mean, it's just for, for for two kids from Newcastle, it was unreal, unreal. But it was the the music was buzzing. You know, rock and roll was huge. Skiffle, funny enough, was on the wane by then. Fifty eight, end of fifty eight. Quite a short-lived, uh, you know, craze, if you like. But so many people in our business started, you know, for, like from Lonnie. He was, you know, he's, he's almost a forgotten influence, you know. So had your music changed in, that, <coughs> in those, those months you not were there? Re not really. I suppose we became, because we were self-taught. Um, I always say, say this to Bert Ween, you know, Hank and, Hank and myself, I think, were the only two guys that made it who didn't use his play in a day book <laughs> you know <That'll> laugh, <coughs> because the play in a day book I don't know if you did you ever oh, see it very much so yeah uh, when you got to about page three it started on demi semi quavers and crotchets mm. and stuff like that <coughs> I said this is not for me I don't think Buddy Holly and Elvis used demi semi quavers and crotchets <laughs> and all that stuff you know <laughs> so um, we just self-taught learned you know whatever the music of the day was we were singing it you know, jamming it, meeting all these all these great people. You know, um, on the nights that we didn't play, or this particular night, I used to sell. There was an orange juice machine at the back uh, of of the coffee bar, <coughs> and uh, I tried to sell the orange juice. And they used to have those paper cups. I don't. Is it polystyrene? Maybe. Yeah. But after <coughs> you could fiddle the. They were, uh, what it was a shilling, I think, for, a, uh, for a, yeah. an orange juice, you know. And you could fiddle a little bit of money because you could use the same cup twice or two or three times, but eventually that cup got soggy, <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know. But anyway, any, anything, to, you had to eat, you know, we had to yeah. eat, you know. And uh, a few months had gone by, and Hank and I were there all of the time, and we got to know so many people, you know, in that summer of 58. And one night, Hank wasn't there, um, Cliff, uh, this guy came down, was playing on the stage, and it was um, Harry Webb, as he was then, mm. Harry Webb and the Drifters. And uh, So there was a Drifters, was there? Th yeah, his, Cliff's group was the Drifters. And they existed? Yeah, they existed, oh, yeah. okay. Maybe they were his original skiffle group, but they certainly, they were his mates and they existed, right. yeah. Uh, Anybody famous in it? 
Um, not at that time. No. Okay. No. And they were from like Chesham in Hertfordshire. Anyway, I'm <coughs> flogging orange juice at the back, and this guy gets up, you know. And he looked amazing. He looked he looked like Elvis because he was mm. he, uh, olive skin, you know, swarthy and long sideburns, you know, black greasy hair. He had the the collar up. You know, Elvis gave us the collar look. You know, the, mm. the collar yeah, yeah. up. Yeah. And I think he had a crucifix. You know, so it was the doing yeah, all Mr. The, cool. Mr. Cool. Yeah. You know. And I, didn't know who he was, and uh, I went back to Hank that night, to back to Finsley Park, and said, there was a great you know, guy in tonight. Looked great, you know, sounded great. Didn't really know who he was. <coughs> and then a few months had gone by, I never thought anything of it. Am I boring you with this story, by the way, because you haven't no, asked me a question far, for no, you're 15 far away. minutes. <laughs> far away. So uh, I'm trying to get leading up to how we met Cliff. Yeah, and, no, uh, absolutely. Evidently, Cliff played there for a few days, and I think they realized that Harry Webb wasn't cool. So they went to the pub a couple of doors away and eventually came up with, you know, Cliff Richards. Um, and they liked Little Richard didn't have an S on it. So it became Cliff Richard because of Little Richard. Right. Uh, so he changed his name, became Cliff and the Drifters. And Because uh, you all changed your name as well, didn't you? Or yeah. Well, I was born Bruce Cripps in, in right. yeah, in, funnily enough, I was born in Bognor Regis. But uh, Hitler, this is November 41, there wasn't room, it was either Hitler or my sir, because Hitler was just across the water at the time. Yeah. So discretion being the better part of valour, we all moved up, you know, up north. Mm. But... Uh, and Hank wasn't Hank Marley, no. Was he it? was Brian... Rankin. Brian Robson Rankin. Well, yeah. I think, yeah, Brian Rankin. But he was, funnily enough, at school he was always Hank. Interesting. Yeah. Always, I mean, I knew him as Hank. I didn't know him as Brian. It was one of those criteria at that particular time. You had to change your name, didn't you, really? The, the well, if you wanted to be in, it, like in the, yeah. the rock and roll business or the skiff, you know, if you wanted to be up on stage, your real name was usually crap, you know. So <laughs> oh. I, I was going to be Buddy Welsh for a while, you know. Once, <laughs> once Buddy had made it, I thought, oh, what a great name, <laughs> Buddy, you know, Buddy Welsh. You know, that would be a great name. So anyway, you're back at the cafe again. So I'm at the cafe, yeah. Yep. Anyway, so a few months gone by, and I think it got to about September of 58. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, Hank was jamming in the afternoon playing and some guy came down um, uh, and said uh, I'm, he'd heard about a great guitarist in the Two Eyes. Now there were two great guitarists in the Two Eyes. Hank Marvin was one of them and uh, <coughs> Tony Sheridan. Have you heard of a guy called yeah. Tony Sheridan? Who finished yeah. up with the Beatles as his backing That's band right, yeah. in Germany. But Tony was another great player. But Tony wasn't there that day, and this guy came down looking for a lead guitarist. He said, um, I managed Cliff Richard, and of course we didn't know really who Cliff Richard was. And he said, I've got a tour starting in like three weeks, I need a lead guitarist. So Hank being, you know, played him a few licks. You single know. notes. Single notes. If you could play, and Hank could, if you could play the introduction to That'll Be The Day. You're in. You're in. <laughs> and Hank could play it. Perfectly. In fact, Hank taught Tony Sheridan how to play That'll Be The Day, the intro. <laughs> because we used to sit and listen, you know, the little dance set, we had a little yeah. dance set record player and you'd play the record over and over and over. Yeah. Over, you know, how does he do that? And, then, and of course the fingering was hard on That'll Be The Day, because being from Newcastle and, and young and everything, we didn't realise that Holly had a capo on. Mm. We didn't know what a capo was. <laughs> So Hank would be doing the stretching, you know, the long, big stretches. Anyway, this guy said, played him a few licks, and I think, my babe and stuff mm. like that, the old, you know, and uh, offered Hank the job. He said, great, would you like to, you know, it's a three-week tour. And Hank said, well, I'll do it if my mate can come, you know. Wow. And uh, we went round the corner, up Dean Street, up into a, uh, a tailor shop, up the stairs, and there, there he was, standing like this, you know, pr practicing for later life, <laughs> getting fitted for his, the famous pink jacket, as it became. You know, yeah. he was, he had the black shirt, the pink tie, and the pink jacket he wore on the first tour. And as I say, Hank and I were 16; he was 17. We sort of looked each other up and down, you know. You know, we we're all pimples and, yeah, you know, all the stuff. And he said, "Will you? Can you come out to my house in?" Uh, and we'll have like an audition, I suppose. So Hank and I went um, on the Green Line bus from the outside Portland Place <coughs> to Chesson in Hertfordshire, took our little guitars with us, you know, 
and did a, an audition in his front room. Cliff lived at a council house with, uh, there was him, his three sisters and his mum and dad. And we went in the front room and did, his, that'll be the day, which Hank could play. A yeah. whole lot of shaking going on, my babe and a few other, you know, a few other tunes of the day. No but, sign of a bass player or a drummer yet? No. No, well, they, they came because the, the bass player and the drummer were in the Drifters. Ah. Uh, that was, okay. we already had those. And a guy called Ian Samwell, Sammy Samwell, who wasn't in Cliff's original group, had written a, a song called Move It. Mm. Move It, fantastic record. And Sammy had joined the Drifters. So you had, for the tour, once we passed the audition, you had Hank, myself on rhythm guitar, Terry Smart on drums, and Ian Samwell, who'd just joined, who'd written Move It, was like the bass player. Not really a bass player, but played the bass. And that, and that was Cliff Richard and the Drifters on this particular, on the first tour. Um, funny enough, on, the very f on that tour was the Most Brothers, have you heard? Yeah. Mickey, Mickey Most, yeah. who also thought they were the Everly Brothers. You know, if you were a yeah. duo, if you were an English two kids singing together, you were the Everly Brothers, or yeah. you were trying to be. And Mickey Most was trying to be with Alex Most, you know, the yeah. two of them. And they'd hired a bass player called Jet Harris for the tour. So Jet, who we knew from the Two Eyes, and we played with during the summer, he was backing Mickey Most. They all heard Hank play, and Hank earned extra money for the tour because the Kalin twins, he played for the Kalin twins, and Mickey and the Most Brothers. So he was working for three people, Hank. Already he was a, <laughs> he was a head. Yeah. Because we finished up getting, we got 12 pound a week on the first tour and pay your own digs. Wow. Yeah. And Hank got a little bit more. Hank got a, definitely a little bit more, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Great, but he deserved it, it was great. And it was just around the UK initially, was it? UK, yeah. All the usual, you know. Was there a record stuff. deal then? Yeah, Cliff had Move It. We weren't on Move It, you see. Cliff oh, had already, already made Move It, yeah. That was the first hit, really. So by the, the tour started October the 5th, I think Move It was in the top 20. Yeah. By the time the tour finished, he was number two. Um, and getting an enormous uh, reception. <clears throat> so much, in fact, that, as I said earlier, you know, we were, we were on just before the Kalin twins, and they were having trouble following him. And they were top of the bill. Yeah. And <clears throat> I think they asked Cliff's management if we would move into the first half, you know, into the... And we wouldn't, or he wouldn't. <laughs> as you do. You know, yeah, absolutely. As you do. Um, so that was it, the first tour, and it was originally for three weeks and just kept going. But let me get back to Move It, because yeah. Hank and myself weren't on Move It. This guy, Sammy Samuel, had written this song uh, on the top on the bus going out to Chessent. And uh, Cliff already had signed a deal with EMI, or Columbia as it was then. And uh, Nori Paramore, bless him, was yeah. the A&R man, the producer. And he had signed Cliff. He hadn't signed the band because all session, you know, in those days, session yeah. men played on the records. <coughs> so on, um, Nori had said they were going to make it all English singers in those days used to cover the American charts. As you probably remember. Yeah. If there was a big number one in America, they'd get some English guy to cover it, you know. Anywhere from, from Cliff to Craig Douglas to, mm. you know, Larry Page. Now, what a move. Larry Page and the Teenage, the teenage Rage. <coughs> his A&R man, for his first record, got him to cover That'll Be The Day by Buddy Holly and the Crickets. Was that a shrewd move? Mm. Anyway, <laughs> Cliff was going to cover something called Schoolboy Crush. That was going to be the A side. And they didn't have a B side. And, and Sammy Samuel said, I've written this song. And played and move it. And Norrie said, right, we'll, we'll do that for the B side. So they had Terry Smart, who was the, the Drifters drummer, who, Cliff's mate. Sammy Samuel, who wrote Move It, on s s sort of second guitar. And Norrie brought in Frank Clark, an old session on big bass. Yeah and a session guitarist called Ernie Shear. People who read the dots could, you know, play yeah. single notes, <laughs> <laughs> you know. And uh, that f uh, 
Ian Samuel actually wrote the da 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 da, -da and he mm -hmm. showed him what he wanted, and the, and the Ernie Shear played it. And of course, oh. it was a fantastic record. Yeah. Fantastic, but it was the B side. And everyone, I wasn't there obviously, and Hank mm -hmm. wasn't there, but Cliff said, oh, no, you, you know, not move it's better than Schoolboy Crush. Mm. And uh, Norrie said, <coughs> he did this a couple of times with us, he said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll take, it, I'll take them both home and play them to my daughters and see which one they like. And they chose Move It. And Move It wow. was the A side. And was <coughs> instant smash. Fantastic record. Mm. It's still a fantastic record. It's a great, it was ahead of its Fif time. 50 it's years later, it still sounds fantastic. Um, and just to get back to the tour, we did the tour. And, and then after that, you know, it, we just kept going. So what happened, did, did sort of Cliff sit down and say, look, I'd like this to be permanent? Yeah, we're just going to go on. It, it was fantastic. And, uh, and who, what was the line-up then? That was yourself? <coughs> at the, at, at that, on the tour. At the end of the tour? When the end of the tour was still Terry Smart, the original drummer. Yeah. Uh, Ian Samuel, Sammy Samuel on yeah. bass. Me on rhythm guitar, Hank on lead guitar. But during the tour, ha uh, Cliff was listening... He listened to Jet Harris on bass, and Jet was the, yeah, the bass player. You know, played single notes. He was just <laughs> a great player and looked great. He had an original sound too. He, he did, yeah. you know. And uh, Jet thought he was James Dean and looked like James Dean. Yeah. You know, we used to call him the Vita Point kid. He used to dye his hair blonde. You know, and, uh, <laughs> the old collar. Everybody used to put the collar up. In Newcastle, none of us did this, you know. It was, we, owe the, we owe this to Elvis, you know. Every, yeah. Everybody wore the collar up, you know. And uh, so Cliff said, um, I think he realised, to be honest, that his, that Sa Sammy, who was his mate, you know, and written Move It, obviously wasn't as good a bass player as, as Jet Harris was. Mm -hmm. And um, so he asked Jet, it was very difficult, he asked Jet to join. Um, he'd heard... Uh, Tony Meehan had jammed with us in the Two Eyes. Uh, as I said, keep saying this, but mm. Hank and I were 16. This kid, we were playing one night in the Two Eyes, and this kid got, said, can I get up and play drums with you for a couple of numbers? And he said, all right. And this 15-year-old kid got up, and it was Tony Meehan. He was a fantastic drummer. And, and what we'd realized during the tour, because we were very experienced at 16, after three weeks' work, <laughs> to be fair, and I'm not being nasty at all, Terry Smart had his limitations as a drummer. Yeah. Cliff was going to be huge. He wanted the, the best in the land. He wanted his band yeah. to be the best. So by January of 59, which is two months after we started, really, um, the original, his mates, left the band, left the Drifters. And then we had Hank Marvin, Bruce Welsh, Jet Harris, and Tony Meehan. Th they were the Drifters. <clears throat> and we played on various records up to Living Doll and stuff like that, hits. And uh, then we start. I told you earlier, we'd had three flops. It, Cliff, w Cliff was always badgering Norrie, saying, you must sign my band, Norrie, you must listen to my band, you know. Sign them to a record deal, which he did. But we'd had flops. Anyway, we tried to, we made a good record called Saturday Dance. It was the last Drifters record. It, that yeah. And we tried to release it in America, or we were going to release it in America. And of course, we didn't realize that there was a black vocal group who were number one at the time, massive vocal group, you know, The Drifters. And they put an injunction. They said, you cannot use The Drifters' name. Oh, right. in a, You know, because we yeah. we've already you know, a big vocal group. So uh, we had to come up with a new name. And as you do, I wasn't there. Jet and uh, Hank got on their scooters and went out to a pub in Rice Lip Lido. Lido, Lido. Right, Rice Lip Lido, yeah. Lido. And they sat there having a couple of jars and uh, talking about you know, the four Jets and the this and the this and the that and the that. And I think Jet eventually said, he said, you know, Cliff's always, you know, when we work, Cliff's in the spotlight at the front and we're always in the, we're in the shadow at the back. Why don't we call ourselves the Shadows? Excellent. And that's where it came from. So we owe it to Jet. <coughs> well, so overnight you became the Shadows? Overnight we became the Shadows. This is about... Uh, 
uh, probably of July-ish of, of mm -hmm. 1959. So we'd only been going, we'd only been in the Drifters for about seven, eight months maybe, if that long. Now you obviously moved from Mrs. Bowman or whatever her name was in Finsbury Park. Not at the time. Are you still there? <laughs> oh yeah. You know, 12 quid a week doesn't give you much in uh... Oh that's true. Did she come and see you play? <laughs> she did, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We I got her a free one. ticket. Wow. Yeah. But, I think she realised we kept raiding her fridge in the middle of the night. Food was disappearing <laughs> out of her fridge. So anyway, so suddenly we were the shadows, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Which is mid-59. And it sort of became known as Cliff Richard and the Shadows, didn't it? It did, yeah. From because, <coughs> well, we've been the shadows, what, nearly 50 years now. Mm. Uh, so... The Drifters was fairly short-lived, but that was the story behind it. We had to change the name. But you had you, you, you had a record deal on your own then, didn't you? We did, yeah. After much badgering by Cliff to Norrie saying, you know, you should listen to my band, they're great, you know, and this, and that. And uh, it was a good band. I mean, it was a yeah. good little band for the time. But, I mean, the, the great. <coughs> he had two great players, you know. Well, three great players, not me, but Tony Meehan was a great drummer. Unique style. Yeah. Hank was fantastic. He's always been a great player. Even, even at that age, he was a great player. Just inventive. Well, inventive. What was unusual is an instrumental band. That was well, what was we became an instrumental band. Mm. Um, we became an instrumental band. We'd had the three flop. The first record was a vocal, feeling fine. Flop, didn't mean a thing. And we even did Oh Boy with it. We went on Oh Boy, uh -huh. yeah. doing Feeling Fine, the new record slot, zilch. Right. This is Cliff's band, here they are, Zilch. So we thought, well, that's been a flop. Then Jet Harris wrote something called Jet Black, an yeah. instrumental bass. Dun, 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 dun. Came out, Zilch, <laughs> nothing. <laughs> then we made it, well, that, that instrumental's failed, let's do another vocal. Because we all thought we could sing, of course. We all wanted to be singers, really. Well, in fairness, you but, can sing. Actually, <clears> but, you know, we didn't have voices and things. Anyway, so then we... Uh, did Saturday Dance, which nearly nearly hit the chart, and we're on tour. We, in those days, Rick, before you were born, we oh toured gosh. probably eleven months a year. We were wow. on tour all the time, all of the time. Not doing a long. I mean, the to, you know top of the bill spl uh, was probably twenty minutes, twenty five minutes. Not a you know, not, but the t traveling <coughs> on tour before the motorways, of course. Mm. You know, the M1 wasn't open then. Yeah. I yeah. did do a bit of that. Did you do a bit of that? Yeah, I did a bit of yeah. that. In the, in the so you're older than I thought then? I think I'm a lot older than you. Oh, it's okay. very kind. I shall pass <laughs> you a check in a minute. But go on, carry on. Yeah. Yeah, so um, where was I? Oh, yeah. 11 months S of the year on the road. On the road all the time. And uh, I've already forgotten what I was going to say. See? Shadows. We're talking about the... Shadows. The, you had the three, the three flops. All oh, right, so we're on tour. And uh, there's a, a, a guy called Jerry Lorden on the mm. tour. So this would be about April of 1960. And Jerry Lorden was a singer-songwriter, and uh, <coughs> he'd had a, a couple of small hits. He had, in fact, on, the, on this particular tour of April 96, he was in the top 10 with a song called Who Could Be Bluer? Who Could Be Bluer? Mm. And he'd had a couple of small chart things, but he'd also had a number one in America. He wrote a song called A House and a Car and a Wedding Ring, which was a big number one hit. Anyway, he was a songwriter. So we're on the coach uh, that we used to sleep on as well, sometimes. And we're all talking, as you do on the mates. We're on the way to wherever. And uh, we're saying, well, we don't know what to do now. We've had, you know, we need a new single. And we've had three flops and, you know, EMI will probably give us the elbow soon, you know. Cause he, we tried the instrumentals. Mm. He said, and he said, I, I've got a tune. Can I play you this tune? I said, yeah. So he went to the back of the bus. <clears throat> and came and he had a, a ukulele. And he said, just listen to this tune. He went, down, 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 down. You know, and playing the rhythm on the ukulele. And we all went, yeah, we like that. We like that tune. Can we play that to, to Nori Paramore? Because Nori was God, you know. So he made a little demo. We took it to Nori. And he uh, said, Nori, listen to this tune. Great tune. He said, yeah, I like that. He said, didn't, have a, didn't have a name at that time. Yeah, yeah Apache. Oh, he was still called, called Apache. I mean, oh, he'd, he'd already called it Apache. Yeah, Apache. Okay. And um, he said, uh, 
yeah, I like that. He said, but your next A-side is going to be <coughs> this song called Quartermaster Stores. Remember that old army song? Yeah. Da, 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 yeah. da, 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 in the stores. Um, so we're in, oh, right, oh. Okay. <laughs> oh. Bear in mind how old we are, you know, yeah. 17 or something, 18 by then. And uh, so we did an arrangement of Quartermaster Stores, put that down which was quite good, it was, you know, mm. Hank had the, the Strat and the Echo Box and stuff, and then we recorded Apache, I think take three, you know. Why did he call it Apache, by the way, do you know? Don't know. Oh, okay. Just, uh, so we f recorded the two tracks, and we went, oh, listen to Apache. I mean, it was, at the time, you know, middle of 1960, June, yeah. July 1960, it was a new sound. Mm. Um, and Norrie said, well, the uh, thing is going to be the A. Quartermaster stores will be the A side. And we went, oh, Norrie, this is like happening again. Yeah. The same thing with Move It. No, Apache's better than, you know, he said, tell you what I'll do. <laughs> I'll take it home to my daughters. And he took Quartermaster stores and Apache and played it to his daughters. And his daughters said, Apache's the better one. Apache became the A side. Did the daughters end up owning EMI, by the no, way? No, <laughs> they should have, I think, yeah. in a way. Um, but it was great. I'll tell you why Norrie was so great. First of all, he, he, he was a proper muso, you know, yeah. he read the dots, all yeah. the stuff. He was a much older man, of course, to, uh, than mm. us. He was probably in his 40s when we were 17 or yeah. something. So he, they were much much more experienced mm -hmm. but what he did do he gave us our he was clever enough he probably couldn't play rock and roll and, and didn't understand it or thought it was a bit maybe below him yeah you know but he left it to the he left it to us yeah he just guided us and let, suggested this and that it, maybe because he didn't understand it so much or what we were trying to do he just left us to it in a way uh still had overall control obviously and um so we released Apache came out, <coughs> so we we had then been Cliff's backing group for eighteen months. Yeah. Apache came out, uh, went to number one, sold a million records, and we were still Cliff's band. I, I mean, I remember I remember very well when it came out. I mean, I went and bought it four and eleven pence. It cost. Was it? It was four and eleven, and, I don't, and it was very different. It was different. Yeah. And, and every band suddenly then, every guitar band, wanted to sound like the Shadows. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the guitar, sorry, not the guitar, the group boom came from, from the Shadows. Mm. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And it was also an unusual thing because if you're in a band, there had to be, there had to be the lead guitar, the Rhythm. rhythm guitar, yeah. drum on the back, and that, and, that, and that was it. The sort of format. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it was, yeah, yeah. So what did Cliff think? He was delighted. He'd been badgering on to Norrie for yeah. you know, 18 months or a couple of years, listen to my band, listen to my group, and they're great, and this, that, and the other. And suddenly, we, you know, we were big as a band, as the group. But it never occurred to you to leave Cliff? <coughs> never. <coughs> no. Uh, because it, I've always said this, you know, from, night, from uh, October 58 until December 68 when I left, that 10 years was the, the Cliff and the Shadows period. But it was never, we never got, ever got the feeling that Cliff was the star and we were the band. Never. Not from yeah. him. Had we got it from management. Yeah. In, you know, the first 18 months, he had various managers. We felt it a bit there, but never from him. He was always the five guys singing, playing, rehearsing, having a laugh, you know. You used to do your <coughs> own spot, though, didn't you, in the, in the we shows? We did, yeah. That came well, up. what would happen then, suddenly the shadows would close the first half do, you know, 18 mm. minutes or something, or 20 minutes, well, mm. interval. And then we would change our suits, because we could afford suits then. We would change from the shadow suit into the back, the cliff suit, and we would come on and back cliff for 25 mm. minutes or whatever. So you had the shadows uh, section, you had cliff and the shadows, the shadows section. Mm -hmm. Great, it was fantastic. But they were the early days of all the screaming, yeah. all the you know, Beatlemania before Beatlemania, all that stuff was going on. And that was just you guys. And that was just the band. Yeah. So In the dressing room. So you must <coughs> have been under pressure then to come up with another really 
hot singles straight after. Yeah, suddenly you get, without realising, you get on the treadmill. Of course, we were yeah. on two treadmills because we were on the cliff treadmill, on the cliff and, treadmill the shadows, yeah. and the shadows treadmill. Um, cliff would be inundated with, you know, songwriters looking, you know, trying to get a cliff record, obviously. Yeah. Um, and then once we'd had Apache, we got lot, you know, suddenly everybody was a, an instrumental writer. So we'd have, you know, Geronimo, yeah. Mohawk, all these songs used to come through the, <laughs> as they do. <coughs> all these great ideas, you know, all these terrible tunes, but, you know, mm. all Indian names. You know, we had all the Indian names in the country. <laughs> and Cliff would have all the great love songs, you know, all the yeah. rock and roll songs, you know. Um, but you had some great instrumentals in them, I mean, FBI and all those, yeah, all uh, those tracks. We, great well, we'd track. started, we had the follow-up to Apache was Man of Mystery, which was mm -hmm. from the... Uh, black and white TV series yeah. at the time. A great tune written by an old songwriter called Michael Carr, who wrote South of the Border. Right. Who then went on to write, now you had a 60 year old guy writing for 18 year old kids, and he wrote uh, Contiki. And he'd always try and take me, Bruce, come to the pub, I've got this idea for something, you know. And then he'd send you a little acetate. Remember the acetates? Yeah. Thing? Kind of put this on and. We went, yeah, wow. that's great. So he wrote South of the Border, Man of Mystery for the Shadows, Contiki for the Shadows. Yeah. The old style songwriters. Now, were you, were you writing yourselves? And we had started to write by then, right? Yeah. Mm. Um, I'll have to backtrack because <coughs> I suppose our, our uh, wanting to write or trying to write probably came from Buddy Holly's influence. Uh, Holly and the cricket started in 57, July 57, so we'd mm -hmm. be nearly nearly 16 then. No, 15. We were 15 then. Because during, uh, during 1958, we started to write songs. I mean, crap, but <laughs> some. <laughs> Good crap. Yeah. <laughs> you know, very twee, very young, very teenage, because that's what it was. Mm -hmm. Pop was very very simple mm -hmm. i love you you love me moon in june all that stuff yeah, yeah. that's what it was <coughs> um so it, but we did start to write so suddenly a year had gone by and uh we were in this position hank and i would write or the four the four shadows would write things together still the same lineup yeah still the same lineup and uh hank and i would write oh i would write something on my own and then I'd be writing something and Cliff would say, I can't finish this, can you, you got any ideas for this, you know? So Cliff and I, we did a couple of those, I'll mm -hmm. come on to. Um, and we became songwriters and, and we had this guy called Cliff Richard who seemed to record every song we'd, we'd you know, we would written. We'd had this f fantastic, he was the biggest star in the country, the, you know, pop mm -hmm. star. And every time Hank and I or the band would write something, he'd say, oh, I love that, let's do that. So it was like, <laughs> it began to, you know, like, get like Christmas every day because yeah. this guy was recording all your songs. And in fact, in, in earlier, you know, in 1960, our record, The Shadows record, Apache, which knocked off number one, Cliff Richard and The Shadows, a song called Please Don't Tease, which I did. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we suddenly we were sort of songwriters in inverted commas. Um, Must be great to knock yourself off the and top. Knocked off his, no, yeah, we knocked That's ourselves off the brilliant. top. Unbelievable, you know, funny little things. So we wrote more, and the more we wrote, the more Cliff recorded them. Um, uh, he and I, because I couldn't finish, I don't talk to him, things like that. Yeah. Bachelor Boy, obviously, later on. Um, Have you got a favourite? Uh, what, as a song? Yeah. No, the one that really sticks out, you go... You know, I'm really proud of that. No, I, I, mean, cringe, I them, cringe at a few. Do you really? I can tell you the ones I cringe at. Go on, then. Uh, I wrote a song called, uh, funny enough, a song I wrote by myself called I Love You, which was the Christmas number one Yeah. in 61, I think. or No, 1960. And the lyric is, um, <coughs> we're not very big in lyrics in Newcastle. <laughs> <laughs> and the lyric goes, because um, we wrote words, not lyrics. Yeah. Yeah. Your love means more to me than all the fishes swimming in the sea. <laughs> That's the first line of it. And, and all these years later, all these years later, I'm in a, uh, we have this great society called SODs, you know, 
I'm, Society I'm of Distinguished Songwriters. Yeah. And I'm sitting, you know, you're sitting with Don Black's, Tim Rice's, fantastic writers, you yeah. know, lyricists, all the top writers. And I, what, have you, what have you written, Bruce? You know, your love means more to me than <laughs> all the fish are swimming in the sea and are going. <coughs> but it was number one. But it was number one. And the same thing with uh, Bachelor Boy. Mm. You know, the last verse of Bachelor Boy. I'll never live this down is, um, as time goes by, I probably will meet a girl and fall in love. Then I'll get married, have a wife and a child, and they'll be my turtle doves. <laughs> we did, I didn't know about meter. We just put words, you know, anything, anything that filled that space near enough. <laughs> And when you're sitting with the top <laughs> writing talent in the, you know, in the country, yeah. you know, it's like, it's very scary. And I go, we'll go up and do a couple of songs. And it's like, wow. <laughs> yeah, so I, can, I can remember all the bad ones. That's another number one, you see. Yeah, all number ones, yeah. yeah. So that, that perhaps is the answer to how to write a number one. Not be a lyricist. <laughs> well, you, I remember, I, I'm guessing it must be about 65 and I was in a band called the Concord Quartet, and there was a guitar player called Jim Bennett, who's probably watching this. Right. And Jim was, he knew everything that the Shadows ever played. And he wanted us to be like a Shadows type band. It was difficult for me, because I only had an electric piano. Yeah. And there wasn't a busting lot for me to do, really. <laughs> um, but uh, we had a sh a sh one particular Shadows uh, LP, and there was one track on it that I loved. And I worked out a way of doing an electric piano. We did it as the band. Uh, not a, perhaps a, the most well-known of the show, Rhythm and Greens. Do you remember that? Yeah, we wrote it. Yeah. yeah. And we played it. I think we were the only band that covered it. We loved it to bits. Well, you're probably the only band that understood, understood it. <coughs> because I'll tell you when it, it was. had some great breaks in it. it I'll tell you when it was. It was a whole fun thing. Uh, in 64, um, the well, we weren't out of style, but music changed, as you know. And yeah. everything... The Stones were here, the Beatles had been yeah. for a year, you know, 63. The Stones was happening, and everything was R&B, man. Yeah. Rhythm and blues, man. They were all playing, everybody was playing rhythm and blues. And of course, the Shadows weren't. You know, we were, we were doing Sunday Night at the Palladium in silk suits, mm -hmm. you know. We looked like the Rat Pack. And we were still only <laughs> about 22 yeah. <laughs> or something, you know, 23. Anyway. Um, so we were, we used to do, we, bec we had become, Cliff and the Shadows had become the establishment. But you see, it's interesting what you say, how things go in a fashion, sort of out of fashion, become established or whatever, and how what goes around comes around. Mm. Because here you are, I won't say how many years later, and you're about to, about to fill the O2. Well... The tickets go on sale. <laughs> no, you know jolly well it'll fill. We don't know. I honestly, I... Well, let me tell you, it will. And, well, and, I, and, and I think deep down you know it will. Because, you know, there's, you go beyond establishment and the shadows have gone beyond establishment. Cliff and the shadows are back together yeah. for the first time in 20 years. And uh, <clears throat> the only downside is probably half our audience have already died because of our age. <laughs> You know, they you have get, children, you, you know. You're going to have Hank. Uh, Hank and I will be 68. Mm -hmm. Cliff will be 69. And Brian Bennett, our drummer, will be nearly 70. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're older than the Rolling Stones. You know what I mean? You know, much is made of yeah. the Stones' age. Yeah. You know. Oh, I, I, just, I just very, very quickly before we sort of finish, you know, it's, you've gone through a few changes, but not as many as a lot of bands have, have gone through. I mean, Brian's been with you. Drumming Brian number. is the new boy. Brian Bennett is the new boy. He joined us in 1961. <laughs> <laughs> and he, of course, it, it we've had a lot of bass players. Yeah, because Jet and Tony left and did some, some stuff on their own. Yeah. And had, had, had a couple of hits and things. The big hits, yeah. Jet's still around doing yeah. it. I saw Jet not so long ago. Yeah. Um, and I must get this in because I, I, you now have a keyboard player in the band. We do. Because, well, or synthesizer player. Well, no, he's a great, you know, keyboard player. Yeah. But what, as you know, I don't have to tell you, telling, talk, telling your granny to suck eggs. When we made records with orchestras and strings, yeah, with the and, strings. All that, and our French horns and all that, yeah. you can do all of that now Yeah. here. So now you can bring somebody into it. So do now it. we brought, you know, suddenly Wonderful Land and yeah. Atlantis and all of these records sounded near enough the record. Yeah. You know. So the O2. 
I mean, obviously, you, you and you, yourself and Cliff and the, the other guys, you've all kept in touch. You've all done things in yeah. the past. You've done the shadows. Doing lots of separate things. things you've yeah. done lots of things. Um, it's going to be quite amazing walking on the O2, isn't it? Well, it is because, A, the, I haven't even been there, but I think it holds about 18,000. It's massive. And a few more, yeah. It's yeah. big. It's big. We're doing all the big arenas, so the Newcastle, yeah. Glasgow, Nottingham, you know, Liverpool, all the 10, 12,000 seaters. See, the great thing, you've got no shortage of music, have you? The only shortage is the actual songs themselves, which are all two minutes long. Do you lengthen them at all? We haven't done it yet. We'll have to... I'll, I'll let you know on the <laughs> when you come and see the show. Well, we will, I think we'll have to somehow, but, you know, it'll be another solo. <laughs> it? It'll be another solo. <laughs> so because, we'll... because all of those pop tunes, you know, when you look back 50 years and, and those hits we've had, most of them were two minutes. Mm. That was the intro, a couple of verses, a middle, a yeah. solo and an outro. That was it. So we're going to have to play 100 tunes, I think, to do uh, <laughs> two and a half hours. Is there nobody else in the bill? Just no you. one else, no. Uh, will you I be think, finishing the first half? I think Cliff, I was just going to say, I think Cliff and the Shadows will obviously open it. Yeah. Open, uh, no, no support. We are the support act. <laughs> we are the support act. Um, Cliff and the Shadows will probably open, and then he'll go and have a rest while the Shadows play the instrumentals, and we'll probably close the first half, and mm. then do the whole of the second half as Cliff and the Shadows, yeah. Well, I should be there. Yeah. I wouldn't miss it for the world but I will be incredibly disappointed if during the interval you don't change your jackets. Goodness me, more expense. More expense. You have to go back to Finsbury Park. <laughs> Bruce, thank you very much, mate. Yeah, thanks.